And so the the long story short is that we've all, you know, created this weird inbred relationship with... <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to the very first Irenacast. We are a weekly podcast dedicated to the exploration of faith and culture. We are your hosts. I'm Jeff. Hey, I'm Mona. And I'm Alan. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to our podcast. We are very excited about starting this thing. It's been two years in the making, and uh, it has been it has been quite the journey from re-records to over-planning to under-planning <laughs> to... <laughs> Everything right. that goes into it. So again, thank you so much for listening to us this week. And uh, yeah, so let us introduce ourselves a little bit more and, and kind of explain how we got together and how this whole thing started. So um, we are all sort of related. Alan and Mona are really related. And I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm married into the family, sort of. Married related. That's right. Well, yeah, Alan and I, I mean, if you've heard the story about Jesus and John the Baptist, you know, when they, when John the Baptist was in the womb, no, <laughs> who was in the womb? Someone was say, in the womb. I would say you're John the Baptist and I'm Jesus, right? Weren't they both oh yeah. Cause I came older. before. <laughs> you came before. No, I'm definitely older than Alan. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> long story short, we have a whole bunch of cousins and I guess like, um, there's like six kids in our parents' family and everybody got pregnant at the same time and had it's a bunch of babies. Busy. Yeah. yeah. So we've, we've so been, we were, we were kind of raised more like brothers and sisters, yeah. our families. Cause there's three girls and three boys. Mm -hmm. Well, four girls, but one came much later anyway. But yeah, we just tormented each other with our friendship. Yes. And <laughs> still do. That's why. Still do sometimes. Yeah. yeah. And then, uh, Alan met Jeff's lovely sister mm -hmm. and several months later, actually I met, I met Jeff's sister through your family. Your sister was right her friend. And so, um, I actually got married to Jeff's sister like eight years ago. I'm really, <laughs> Almost. Jeff, I'm really surprised still that you let this happen. <laughs> yeah, I am too. Sometimes <laughs> I'm a catch. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and then you guys, you guys, you, um, Mona and Jeff knew each other, right? Pretty far back. Yeah. Awesome. So the first time I went to youth group as a little, what, 12 year old, um, sixth grader going into seventh grade, I was, um, I think the first time I remember meeting Jeff, I was invited to McDonald's after youth group. And this was a really big deal, you know, to go out with the youth group kids as like a terrified little like tween. Mm -hmm. And so I showed up to McDonald's and all the youth group kids were there. And Jeff was like a, a, one of the youth leaders and like in the center of this flock of youth kids. And he was telling these cool stories, like talking with his hands. And I was just like, like blown away by how cool these people were. And I was never going to fit in. <laughs> so Jeff was my youth leader for several years. And, uh, now I'm friends with his wife and, you know, so this is all go like years and years back at, at least a decade. Right, Jeff? Yeah, I would say yeah. so. It's been at least cause we've, we've been married for you and your wife. Almost, have been yeah. My wife and I have been married for, uh, 16, <laughs> almost 15 and a half years. So are you serious? And then we met you the year before we got married. So yeah, yeah. it's been a while. It's been almost 20 years. And so the, the long story short is that we've all, you know, created this weird inbred relationship with <laughs> <laughs> different ways of, of knowing each other. And uh, that has culminated finally in the pinnacle of this podcast. So yes. you get to experience. Well, the thing that came before all of us knowing each other and then now is that is like the many, many hours sitting around someone's kitchen table having these like epic debates about mm. theology and faith and culture. So that I think was probably the beginning of the podcast long when the, tw the podcast was just a twinkle in our eye. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Our, even though our, our relationships are, are way back they're they're all kind of rooted in the same church culture. We were all mm -hmm. evangelical youth group kids and now... Yeah. Uh, spoilers, but we're no longer that <laughs> uh, even close to it. We have, what? we have, <laughs> yeah, sorry to break it to you guys. Oh my God. But what we, did I sign up for? <laughs> <laughs> but we have, we, that's part of the reason why we wanted to start the podcast because these conversations that we had together, they were, they, they tend to happen at significant times in our journey as we progressed yeah. and move forward mm -hmm. in our faith. 
And the, the nice thing about it, even though we do have disagreements and, and we're not always on the same page, but the nice part about these conversations that we've had over the years at varying times when we finally get together is that we realize, wow, we're basically headed on the same path. And it's really cool to see how the relationship is strengthened by the, the paths that we've chosen in, in all of our different ways and, and how our faith has evolved. And we're hoping to kind of record that evolution from this point forward with this podcast and, and, and watching things move forward from there. And it started from a simple conversation that Alan and I had uh, two years ago now about um, a blog that he had started. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I started a blog. Um, actually, I started the blog probably five years ago. And at first, I made it anonymous and wrote from the perspective of faith and some of the things that were coming up in um, church and, and culture. And I wrote anonymously because I was a youth pastor and didn't want to get in trouble for any of the stuff that I had to say. <laughs> so I, I wrote some things that I was processing through. And then uh, eventually I put my name to it and made it more public. And um, over the years kind of had people comment on stuff and talk to me. And um, I invited people to, to write as well. And um it's actually the, the name of the blog was Anirenicon or is Anirenicon. And that basically is Anirenicon is something that brings peace. And my idea was that I had this um, church experience, this experience of God and faith. And then I had my experience of culture and the world. And a lot of times those things didn't fit very well for me. So I think the blog was supposed to be a place where those things can meet each other not just in me, but process, process them out in public and hopefully end up at a place that's a little more peaceful than, than when I started. And so honestly, sometimes that means like my religion that I've had in the past has been critiqued. And sometimes that means, you know, the culture around my life has been critiqued. And so, um, the goal always was to get other people to join the conversation and be a part of, of the voices. Hence, Jeff and Mona <laughs> and now yeah, they're yeah. part of it. <laughs> and when Alan started his blog, I, it was actually super inspiring to me because he was putting a lot of work into it. And some of the stuff he was writing was, was really good. And, uh, I actually started a blog shortly after he did basically mm-hmm. by Alan's prompting. Cause I, he was, he was encouraging me to do so and it failed miserably. I wrote maybe four or five different things and it just wasn't, I don't know. It wasn't something that I was motivated enough to really do all that much. And, mm-hmm. uh, we had had some conversations and I was just frustrated about the whole writing process because I'm not much of a, a writer. And uh, I just... Well, you have great ideas. I mean, yeah. like I, I saw some of the unpublished stuff and I was like, man, that's you got some great ideas. Yeah. And I'm sure, <laughs> you know, there's a lot of psychological reasons, but that I probably didn't post them all. But, you know, that's another podcast. Um, <laughs> but uh, I remember us talking and just saying, it would just be easier for me to, to talk about these things. And that kind of got us mm-hmm. talking about, well, what about a podcast? And um, I'm an avid podcast listener and we just started doing the research about what technology we need and all the stuff to get together. And then we decided, well, mm-hmm. it can't be just the two of us because it would be really boring. And uh, I, the first person I thought of was Mona because she's it would be great addition. Not only does she know so much about the things that we want to talk about, but she <laughs> helps balance out the personality and the maleness of, of Alan and myself. <laughs> which which has actually happened in the past quite a bit. That's that That's the thing is that the three of us have been talking for years now. Yeah. about all of these topics and we've seen each other change over time. And so it's true. kind of a, kind of a cool way to have all of us talk together. Yeah. No, it's super true. I can't even believe the amount of change. Like, like Alan, just thinking about you, <laughs> in, you in college and like, yeah. I remember when you first started your blog, I was like, Oh boy, what's this <laughs> 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 meaning? Like, meaning like you're, you know, in a super conservative environment and um, yeah. yeah, you know, all of us had our like phases of like utter dogmatism, you know, or like, we wouldn't like hesitate to call people heretics. <laughs> you know, we always stop short of saying burn them at the stake, but, but, it, but we you were know, very sure of ourselves. Sometimes. Right. Yeah. It's- and then, you know, we got older and wiser and realized like life is not that simple and you know, yeah. but well, let's not pretend that we're not still sure of ourselves. <laughs> we're still I'm sure. S- somewhat still less sure. sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure with not being sure. That's what I'm sure about. So that's going to be, the podcast. I mean, this essentially what we'll do is we want to uh, make sure that we have a topic of, of conversation uh, every week and break it up a little bit with some fun segments that we have. And then there'll be some the, some topics like the topic that we have today, which is uh, post-evangelicalism, that uh, 
will require, not necessarily require, but we want to be able to provide a, a, a healthy framework for the, some of the things that we're talking about. So occasionally, um, most likely Mona or Alan, and then maybe from time to time myself, will provide additional um, supplemental episodes that'll be more uh, dense and heavy on information and places where you can go to learn more about the things that we're talking about. Uh, but as far as the main podcast, we just really want to concentrate on on bringing the conversations that we've had together on to a wider scale and hopefully other people joining in the conversations through various ways that they can communicate with us through the podcast. So, um, so without, yeah, any- we really hope this is really interactive. Sorry, if I can jump in there, Jeff, like no, we, go for it. we really hope this is a wider conversation. And that's part of the reason we're not just sitting around a kitchen table doing this anymore is that we want to talk to more people. So please like write us, engage with us, interact with us. We want to hear people's thoughts. Tell Mona how wrong she is about the things she says, because I know that she likes that personally. I've been doing it what? for years. <laughs> no. You shut your dirty mouth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah we, we definitely want to hear from people. That's yeah. that's why we're doing this. Yeah, Part absolutely. Of the fun, and, for sure. and you can check our show notes for more information. And at the end of the podcast, we'll give you ways in which you can contact the show. And uh, hopefully we'll hear from you. So uh, before we get into our main conversation, we uh, have a fun little segment that we've planned out. And we're calling it uh, Jesus or Jay-Z. So stay tuned for a little bit after the other side of the music. And we will uh, we will play this game. I don't know if it's a game. Anyway. Uh, we'll see you on the other side. All right. So this is a segment we like to call Jesus or Jay-Z. Yes. And basically each of us have come to the table with a couple <laughs> song lyrics and it is the job of the other hosts to guess whether those song lyrics are coming from a Christian song or a song that is a love not song Christian. or a hip hop song <laughs> or a not Christian song. Um, yeah. As much as we can put definitions on songs like that. Anyway, so I will start. Here's, here's the lyric. Whenever I'm alone with you, you make me feel like I am home again. Oh, come on. That could be like 50 songs. <laughs> Actually, I think I, I do think I know what song this is. Oh, really? Yeah, I can sing the rest of it in my brain. So this is my problem. No, don't sing it in your brain. Sing it to us. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Whenever I'm alone with you, you make me feel like I'm free again. Whenever I'm alone with you, you make me feel like I'm young again. That's that's a um, that's like a rock. This is my guess. I think that's like a rock song, like a, from like a classical, not a classical, sorry, classic rock band kind of thing. Okay, so, so I'm gonna go non secular. Okay, is what is what my guess is. Uh, yeah, I have to agree with Alan, but just for the sake of argument, I'll guess the other one and then. <laughs> All right. Well, you were half right, Alan. It is a secular song, so it is, is not it, a Christian song. Is it like The Doors or something? No, something it, weird like that? It, it's Adele uh, called Love Song. Oh. What? Yeah, it's an Adele song. Wait, wait, which one is it? Uh, Love Song. Oh, I yeah. It, I thought it was a, whenever I'm alone with you, you make me feel. Well, oh, that's it's a pretty okay, generic anyway. lyric, so I'm sure it's <laughs> present in a lot of different songs. <laughs> Probably. Someone out there knows exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> They're going <laughs> to they're gonna yeah, so tell me what's on email the podcast and let Alan know that he was right. <laughs> Thank you. All right, Mona, you're up. Okay. I want to live, breathe. I want to be part of the human race. I want to live, breathe. I want to be part of the human race, race, race. Where do we go from here? The words are coming out all weird. Where are you now when I need you? I am going to go with non-Christian because... It really? talks about wanting to be a part of the human race and <laughs> the human race is sinful and despicable and we shouldn't want that. So I'm going to go with it's it's non-Christian. I'm going to go the opposite. I think it's a Christian song because any time you use the word race that much, I think it's some sort of metaphor. <laughs> so I'm going to say this. For racism? No, not racism. Like you're oh. the race, you like- know, that's like your Christian life. I'm, so I'm going to go. I'm going to go with a Christian okay. song. Okay. You guys, this is my all-time favorite band, Radiohead. I'm very sorry, Alan. Oh, come on. Yeah. I tricked you on purpose. <laughs> That's good. That good. Alright, Alan, you got All right, one Alan, for you us. Got one? All right, here we go. If I could just sit with you a while, I'd need you to hold me moment by moment till forever passes by. That sounds familiar. I think it's a Christian song, but I can't place who it is. It sounds like something out of a Nicholas Sparks movie. <laughs> Do they yeah, have I don't know. Nicholas Sparks movies? I know they have books, right? But they've been making movies of that. The Notebook is Nicholas oh, Sparks. Okay. 
Oh, forgive me. <laughs> forgive me. <laughs> no, I didn't. I don't understand it. Someone, someone, one of our listeners should write in and explain to us why we should like the Notebook. Maybe, but I don't understand the cultural phenomenon of the all Notebook. I, all I know is, you know, you slap someone and tell them that you love them, and that's all I remember from that movie. Something like that. And the part when he's like, "What do you want?" <laughs> that part when he- never seen it. Oh, nor do I plan no. on it. We'll have to remedy yeah, that. Don't waste <laughs> Okay, so, so what do you think, uh, Jeff? You're you're saying it's a worship song. I'm saying it's a, a it's Christian a Christian song. song. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'll go. I'll go the opposite. What do you think? It is actually by Mercy Me. Oh, that is a Christian song. I knew it sounded familiar. I'm pretty sure I'm winning. Yeah, I'm winning. Hashtag, hashtag winning. Do people hashtag winning anymore? Charlie no. Sheen. Lost. We will. <laughs> we will. <laughs> we'll bring it back. We're <laughs> ironically hashtag winning. All right, you ready for my second? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Giving it over. I was flat on my back. <laughs> is that all it is? Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt and laugh. Just... No, that's fine. That I was, I was hoping Life for that response. Kafka. You can't just do. Okay, <laughs> we need to make some rules here. That's too line. Okay, um, Jesus. I'm gonna go Jesus song. Giving it over, I was flat on my back. That definitely sounds like a Jesus song to or me. Or a country song. I don't know. I was flat on my back and my dog. In the back of that red rag top. (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to say Jesus song also. It is a Jesus song. It is by the Newsboys. It's called Giving It Over. Oh, my God. (laughs) Newsboys was like the first concert I ever went to, and they had the flying drum set. You guys know this? I remember that. I have seen that personally. We all have. I think it was the disco, the Love Liberty disco tour. You guys know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I just saw the bit Spirit West Coast, so I don't know. Okay, I got another one. Ready? I've seen it coming for quite some time, man. I don't know what you're thinking. How can the two of us walk in stride if we don't see eye to eye? You've got me all messed up inside. Um, I'm going to go with Christian. Yeah, it sounds combative enough to be <laughs> Christian. <laughs> <laughs> you guys, did you ever have a DC talk phase? Everyone Absolutely. did, right? Yes. Everyone did. Everyone. DC talk, my word. That is. DC. Yeah, this is, um, this song is, it's killing me. Cause I want you to know. Da, 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 da. Oh, that's right. That sound familiar. Yeah, there you go. We were, we were Jesus freaks in our own time. With it was such talk. a Jesus freak. Oh. Absolutely. For sure. I'm still a freak. I just don't know exactly. <laughs> <laughs> just so. not so much for Jesus. <laughs> okay. So my lyrics, my lyrics, here we go. I can't live without. All I think about, all I want is you. You're all I dream about. I can't live without. All I want is you. I mean, if like a stalker told me this, I'd be really creeped <laughs> out. But you I know, think it's there, Christian there is a there is a hot quotient though, right? Because like if they're you know if they're decent enough, it's less stalkery. Absolutely, that's what I've been told. They're just <laughs> if, it, if it's like the bachelor lyrics. telling you this, you're allowed to be swooped off the road from it. Mm-hmm. That's not that's not a phrase. I think I just made it up. Swooped off the road. You guys know what I mean. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm gonna also go with Christian. I think. Okay, it's actually by Stained, so it is non-Christian. Oh. Are you sure? Right. I'm positive. It's from the song "All I Want." Stained. Okay. Oh, mm-hmm. Such generic lyrics. I think that's. The, I guess that's the art of this game. Is <laughs> the is more not. generic the the well game. We're not really keeping score, but. Oh, we are. Oh, and you are. Well, I won. What? We all lost. No, <laughs> you can't win this game. I'm just declare me the <laughs> eternal awesome. winner. All right. Well, that'll do it this week uh, for Jesus or Jay Z. And uh, on the other side of the music, we'll begin our discussion. All right, so this is our very first topic, and uh, we picked a broad topic because it kind of represents where we're coming from, and we're talking about post-evangelicalism, and we'll have a lot of information as we go on this, um, but basically, we kind of wanted to share our journeys as to far as why are we not evangelical anymore, or why are we confused as to what our, what to call ourselves, and what were some <laughs> of the things that... <laughs> that, would, that would be me. Yeah. <laughs> and, sure Alan's just confused in the head in general. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so so uh, for us, like, what were some of the things, uh, especially for, for, um, for all of us and, and Alan and, and Mona, feel free to jump in, but what, what drew you away from what you used to believe to where you are now? Because I, I would say it's pretty safe to assume that if, if, if each of us met our past selves, we would 
call Cry. ourselves heretics or <laughs> non-Christians or whatever word we would use to describe someone who doesn't follow Jesus. Uh, I, would, I would, I would, you know, it'd be tough because I'd be hugging myself saying it gets better. <laughs> that's <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> can't hate someone that's hugging you. It's all good. Wait, who, which self is hugging yourself? I would hug the younger version of myself and just tell him that, you know, it's not always going to be like this. <laughs> that's what I would say. I think I'd pat myself on the head and be like, oh, honey, so much you don't know. Yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What about you, Jeff? I don't know what I'd say. I think I'd just be, <laughs> I, it, 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 it's hard because it's one, one thing that's difficult for me is I'd, I'd be tempted to tell myself, you know, stop, you're wrong, get out of here. But if I look back, I wouldn't be where I am today if I didn't go down that path and choose to follow that way for a while and really invest and jump into it like I did back then. Very true. So, yeah. uh, and I, I kind of like where I'm at now. So yeah, that's a tough one, but I'd be disappointed in myself. And I would say that it would probably be more my younger self yelling at my older self than anything else. So, so yeah. <laughs> and for me, I don't know, I don't know where, where you two are at, but for me, one of the main things that drove me away was this, the idea that every time I felt like I questioned something or every time I learned more, I realized I was holding on to something that necessarily wasn't right. And when I go to certain people, I didn't even say right, but when I go to people with these questions, I I was easily and quickly dismissed and given a warning that that's a slippery slope to go on and you might, you know, find yourself in hell one day or, you know, whatever. <laughs> yeah. I think I can relate to that. I mean, like in my experience, questioning is not one of the <laughs> most noble things you can do in the church background that I come from. You're not encouraged to ask questions very, very much. Well, you know, it's funny, like, I, when I left for seminary, my dad sat me down and told me not to lose my faith. And I thought this was one of the strangest things I'd ever heard. And I think there is this like cultural phenomenon, especially within like evangelical or co culture or conservative Christianity. That's like, um, don't think too hard or you'll get yourself in trouble. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. like knowledge is knowledge puffs you up. My knowledge is dangerous. And so if you go down that path, like you might be lost to darkness. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, instead of an idea that like knowledge comes from God, like knowledge um, is seen as like kind of other than God. So anyway, I, I had this idea that like, I, f I had this strong sense or almost, I don't know, I would even use the word calling that I needed to explore ideas about God and, and language about God. And I, and I felt like I was, I wanted to be an astronaut, but my family was like, why would you want to go out there? There's no oxygen. It's scary out there. Like stay home where there's ground underneath your feet and you know where things are. And, and I'm like, but I, I have to, I have to see, I have to, I have to see the limits of this. I have to know what there is to know. And, and just people looking at me like I was nuts. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, no, that's a really, that's a good way to put it. I like that, that, that analogy. Cause I think that expresses much better what that whole idea of yeah you know in that that it's funny because it was always like well you know you shouldn't question god or whatever and it was almost as if like why would this infinite god that we say we believe in be threatened by other information and why would this god limit us to just the small sliver of information to go off of and then anything else outside of that punish us for I think yeah, that, uh, no, it doesn't make any sense. And, and for me, there was like a lot of a fear, fear attached to that too. I mean, fear was kind of the um, the way that you stayed within the bounds of not asking those questions and staying on the ground and staying on the solid things because you're just, you were afraid of all that stuff. And so I think like for me, when I let go of fear, it moved me to a very different place than I was before. I had to internalize that if something is true, then it belongs to God. Like God is the God of reality, not of the stuff that I just make up or whatever. And so when I was no longer afraid that I was going to lose God, that I, um, this is kind of weird, but my whole life, right before I was old enough to really think about all this stuff or before I had the chance to process everything, God was still God. The world was still the world. I was still a human being. So really like not much has changed since I was born. I'm just learning more about the situation that I'm already in. So it, it makes little sense to be afraid that I'm going to discover that God is different than I thought. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I see what I you're saying. I think it would be helpful. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. <Jared. laughs> no, I was, well, just... was going to say, I think it might be helpful for our, <laughs> our listeners if we talk more about who God was to us back in the day, like you just said, Alan. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. That's a good point. And, and yeah. So that, that would be my question is, Alan, I'm curious, like what, um, I don't know, Mona, for you, was, was fear involved anywhere in that process? 
Yeah, for sure. I think, well, the fear of like losing your faith for one, but I mean, Mm -hmm. so I was raised Pentecostal, a Pentecostal minister's daughter. And so there's like a really strong sense of Satan acting in the world. Do not give Satan a foothold. Like we're going to pray against Satan. It wasn't like so strict. My folks would joke around about it. Like if, if if we were in church and the sound system was acting weird, they'd be like, oh, pray over the sound system. You know, it's a joke. But really there was a very strong sense, especially when I was very young, that like, the devil is alive and well, and the devil is seeking, roaming the earth like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour, and you better get out of the way, and you pray, better pray for protection against the devil. It was just like a lot of devil language. Instead of looking at like the reasons people do bad things to each other, or the nature of addiction, or mental health, or um, medicine, like instead of looking at like what actually might be real material, like rational explanations for things and why they go wrong and why people do bad things. It was like, it's just all spiritualized. All of it was in very, very spiritual terms. So like good versus evil, heaven versus hell, Satan versus Jesus. Like it's just this cosmic struggle that we're caught in the middle of all the time. And so I think it, if you're raised to think that, like I, for me, I, I became like almost par- on the verge of paranoid in some ways, like mm-hmm. Can you guys relate to that at all? Any of that? I can. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Can. yeah I was gonna- I, I, I'm a little bit different. I mean, like um, I wasn't raised in a Pentecostal church. I grew up in like a non-denominational kind of Baptist background. So for us, everything was about the Bible. Um, you, we weren't afraid that Satan was going to lead us down a certain path. There was a little bit of talk about stuff like that, but we were more afraid that one day we would lose our own faith or something or discover that we never had true faith in, you know, the Bible and the God of the Bible. So for us, it was like, don't ask questions that erode the authority of the Bible in any way. You know, don't argue with the text. You're just supposed to obey. So maintaining this obedience, not ask involves not asking questions. It's like, that's, that's more of my background. And and the reason I am where I am now is because I did love the Bible so much that I started to study it and ask all these different types of questions of it and um, got to know it really well. I went to a conservative undergrad for my bachelor's and then I went to got my master's degree in biblical studies and theology. And uh, for me, it was like learning about the Bible was what actually took me out of my community because we were taught you had to read it one way and not to ask certain questions of it. And so Actually, we treated it, the Bible in a way that it couldn't function, that I don't believe it can function for human beings. And so now that I relate to it differently, I would say I've, I've moved kind of away from evangelicalism, the, the one that I grew up with, hmm. which is a little bit different than the one that, that I think that's kind of the point is that we all grew up in evangelicalism, but it's all a little bit different. We all have different backgrounds and our churches were even different. Um, so when we say we're post evangelical, we're really like post evangelicalism is more than one because we have these different streams inside of this common background. But for you, Jeff, you're saying that it was more about the community and feel like you were on the outside of that is what you couldn't process, right? Yeah, I I guess, I guess now that you guys had talked about, you know, obviously I grew up Pentecostal too. So, um, that the the only time I remember being afraid when it came to the whole spiritual thing was I remember, um, I was at this altar call and I was, you know, crying and singing songs and stuff like that. And someone came up to me after afterwards and said, God told me to give this to you. And it was this little pamphlet. Um, and it was a journal from an exorcist and, uh, yeah. So I was like, Oh, this is interesting. You know, I was, I was kind of interested in that. I, I watched a lot of horror movies when I was a kid. (laughs) So, uh, so I read through it and I remember reading this one part where the the exorcist in his noted that most of the people that he cast out when they were in a worship setting, they would yawn a lot. And, uh, what? Yeah. And, and he was, oh, you know, he was awesome. talking about how this was, you know, them kind of getting rid of these bad things in them or whatever. And I remember being freaked out because I always yawn during worship. I think I sing wrong or something and my breath is short. And I remember there was this like three or four week span of time where every time like we would go to church, I wouldn't sing because I was like, oh my gosh, there's something wrong. Or I'd sing a lot because I'd try to yawn a lot to get all the like <laughs> evil out of me or whatever. Uh, wow. It was, it was, yeah, That's it was intense. There's always these weird things because I was, I was always curious about stuff like that. Um, mm-hmm. But I don't, I don't know. I, I wouldn't say fear was, I, I, I guess, Alan, that's a good point is that fear for me was the, this whole fear of like, if I question too much, then I lose my community. Yeah. Like I lose my friends. I lose people that I look up to. And uh, I don't know, maybe that's why I stayed in it longer than maybe I should have because I was so invested in the relationships and I knew that oh, for sure. 
I knew that those relationships, even though it wasn't said, and even though if you talk to the person face to face, and this isn't everyone, but those relationships were conditional on whether I believed the same things. Ours too. I mean, like me too. That was, that was my experience. I think that when you're evangelical, um, for the most part, you look at the world as Christian and non-Christian. You divide everybody between kind of this black and white. These people are Christians. These people are not. And I have to relate to them in pre- prescribed ways, right? Did you guys ever, yeah. were, were you ever told that you're not supposed to be, the word we used was unequally yoked with non-believers, as in you shouldn't form these deep connections with non-Christians because they're somehow going to influence you and make you less Christian. Were you ever told that growing up? I was told a different version of that, but absolutely. I was told that non-Christians didn't have the Holy Spirit like I did. So I could try to be friends with them, but ultimately like we wouldn't really have a deep understanding of each other because we didn't share the same spirit. Yeah. And I, honestly, if I'm honest, like there were times in my, my stint as a youth pastor where I perpetuated that sure. myth. Yeah. You know? I've, mm-hmm. And those, those know, are the, th- those are the things that are hardest for me is not so much of what I believed and why I believed it, but the times that I, that I actually taught those things to someone, you know? And so, so maybe you need to like meet your former self and forgive him. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> maybe. There we go. There's going to be some healing pastor. right now, right now on this podcast. Tear up right now. Just let, me, let me mute my mic so I can blow my nose. I thought you were going to say so you can yawn. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yawn it all out. <laughs> yawn it out, Jeff. Yawn it out. So I, yeah, no, it's, a, it's an incredibly painful thing, I think, to feel, for me, to feel both paranoid and alienated from other kids my age. Like I, And I really, I, I had such a devout, extreme, almost militaristic sort of evangelizing faith that I... I, I didn't see anybody as being equally yoked to me because no other kid was like devoted enough to Christian to the Christian cause. You know, like I was the president of my Christian club on my senior year of high school on campus at a public school. And, you know, I was like leading prayer meetings and all this and worship services. And, you know, and I, I try not to disparage that past because that's part of who I am. I don't hold any like spite toward my past. I just see things differently now. But I just remember feeling so incredible incredibly lonely for so much of my childhood. And I think unnecessarily so, because if I had believed it was possible to make really good friends, um, I, I might've done it. I don't know. Yeah. It, it, there's definitely a loneliness in that. I think it's especially prominent when you're involved in ministry, you know, um, it, mm. it's only been five years since I stopped working in an evangelical church. And at that time, I was, I, I remember oh, it felt like every year there was a little bit more of myself to hide. There was a little bit more of myself mm. that I had to kind of keep under wraps because I, I wouldn't be accepted or I wouldn't fit in or, um, you know, and I already had things coming at me all the time. Like I wasn't a very good Pentecostal. So I had people saying that I didn't believe in the Holy Spirit and, you know, never to my face, of course, but just all these different things. And it was like, ah, and then it got to that one point where it was like, all right, I can no longer hold this tension anymore. Mm. Actually, a lot of our conversations, Jeff, over the, over the course of all of that, when you had been a youth pastor and then I became a youth pastor and we had um, talked about ministry was that ministry was lonely. And hey, what's money that doesn't have to be, I mean, like we both, when we were both in the middle of it, like I, I heard you and I, it totally, my experience mirrored yours in that I felt very alone when I thought certain things and I was in a certain um, setting. But like, I do believe now that ministry doesn't have to be lonely, you know, that the Christian community doesn't have to be a lonely place. <laughs> and I, I think I'm, that might even be weird for me to hear. Um, I don't know. I don't have that same experience necessarily that, that, that you guys did um, as far as like being lonely or um, growing up in, inside of evangelicalism. Because I've just been blissfully ignorant my entire life. I thought everybody thought exactly like I did. <laughs> like I thought that I, I, I don't know. I'm I'm not I'm not as aware of where other people are at, um, especially growing up. Mona, you were talking about being very devoted, and then you know people were not exactly where you were at. I think that might have been the case with me too. I was very involved in leadership and very dedicated to my youth group, but I didn't really discover until after the fact that. Um, that's not how other people experience church. And actually that's, that's kind of what molded me is that I was so invested and loved it so much that I realized like um, there are some things that that way of relating to God in the world is not sustainable. You know what I'm saying? Mm. Like if I didn't take it very seriously, maybe I could have done that for a lot longer, but because I was so serious about my faith, it's like, I'm going to give, I'm going to give it everything. And I really did. And I gave, you know, even the study of the Bible, which again, for me is so central, I gave it everything. And then I realized that that couldn't be 
sustained over my whole life, or at least even in a healthy way. Well, and that's the, the, kind you know, of going- the, the irony of the whole thing is that if not for the background where we all had this fervent or zealous faith or whatever, we may not have had the motivation to get to a place where we are now where we were willing to learn about all that stuff and kind of move ourselves into that place. So, I mean, thankful for that background that that instilled mm-hmm. in me some kind of desire and uh, uh, a yeah. motivation that was beyond what was in front of me to, to move forward. But then once you get to a certain place, then that's where it got frustrating was because you're like, well, wait, but this doesn't make sense anymore. Yeah. Going back to the astronaut analogy, um, I actually heard, a, I think it was a radio, like a, This American Life or something like about how astronauts, when they go up into the stratosphere and they actually see the earth, like firsthand, all of the earth, they understand weather patterns and geology and, and all of these things. And like, it's like this, um, almost all astronauts remark about this epiphany moment where they, they just understand like the earth in a different way and they see things they never saw. Sorry to interrupt. It's actually called the overview effect is is what it's called. Really? uh, I don't know how to say it. It's not a name. (laughs) No joke. I wrote an, an article on the blog about that. So if you want to, if you want to go check it out, I wrote this little thing on panentheism or something like that. Like we'll back the, in the day, we'll put the link to that blog in the show notes if go. you're interested in it. Yeah. The over. Okay. So so I think like all of us are kind of describing this phenomenon as like you study and study because you're interested and this stuff fascinates you and you're passionate about it and then you get to a certain place and you you turn and look around and you're like, oh my word, things are different than I thought or I have a bigger mm-hmm. understanding than I thought. I mean, for me, it's interesting that I, you know, a lot of people maintain a tether to the ground, like um, a lifeline or something, like either staying in a church community or something like that. But I've really ventured like outside of that. So it, I think it's really interesting that you guys have both gone into pastoring and gone into ministry. And I've actually yeah. gone kind of a pretty different direction and don't really, don't really, I'm not really part of a church community. Like I'm loosely affiliated, but it doesn't bother me not to be part of church anymore because you know, it just, it's not something that I feel like my soul needs, even when I'm trying to be completely honest with myself. And, um, so yeah, I mean, I, I've actually never asked you guys like what got you into pastoring and what keeps you in pastoring. I think that's interesting. Do you want to answer that Jeff? Um, yeah, I guess so. Uh, for me, the, what initially got me into it was I was going to be a, a youth pastor for life. Um, and basically because I had good youth pastors and I had bad youth pastors, but the good youth pastors really, helped me when I was an adolescent. You know, I was, I was super awkward. I didn't have a dad. I didn't have a lot of uh, healthy adults around me in my life to, to get information from or to just learn basic things. And the youth leaders and youth pastors that I had were invaluable to me. And because of that, I think, I think it's just natural for anyone when there's someone you look up to, you want to be like them. So I became interested in, in wanting to be in leadership and help them out. And then that gave me a uh, desire to continue that. And I just wanted to be that for someone else who didn't have the same, the solid family structure that everyone else had or anything like that. And uh, that that's what kept me in it were the students for as long as it did just to be able to, to be that for them and, and give them new perspective and help them through those things. And uh, somewhere in the middle of that, because I had so many instances of, of being affected by where the church was broken, it evolved into this, this desire to, okay, I don't want to just help this particular group of people, but I feel like I can be of help to the church as a whole. And now that I find sure. myself caught in the middle of these two church worlds where I grew up and I have a lot of these fond memories of the way evangelical church is done that aren't in the more mainline liturgic kind of settings. And I find myself caught in the middle and feeling like, well, maybe I'm not the only one and really wanting to be a, pro- a part of maybe providing a new I don't like using the rel- using the word relevant because it's so overused, but I guess it's an appropriate word. But just a, a, <laughs> a place where, where the community, there's this, I don't know, there's just a freedom in, in, in um, being a part of that and, and really being a part of helping cure some of the broken things that I, affect, that I was affected by. Oh, that's amazing. That's cool. For, for me, it, it boiled down to a lot, of, a lot of what Jeff said is similar, but for me, it was... I get easily excited about things. <laughs> you two probably know this from, I don't know, watching me. You grow. excited? <laughs> <laughs> no, about, Alan, about, that's silly. About everything. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. So for me, I've always been excited about God and excited about the Bible and excited about church. And I realized that that's not an excitement everyone always shared growing up. So when I saw people talk about God um, when I was in high school or junior high, 
sometimes people would make God boring, <laughs> I think is probably the best way to describe it. Uh, I'd see pastor speak or something and it'd just be like this really boring experience where people aren't really engaged. Um, and then I experienced some of that in my uh, bachelor's degree program. And, you know, if I'm honest, even in my master's degree and, and, and beyond, and I myself have been in the past in a, in a place where I'm upfront talking about God and it's not something that's necessarily always engaging and not that it always has to be. But for me, I always thought, if I ever got the opportunity to speak about God in front of a group of people, which by the way, if you're not a part of a church, it's very difficult to explain what a pastor is kind of like or what teaching is like, because you really have a group of people who form their most of their identity on the stuff you're talking about and you talk about it on a weekly basis. It's actually that's a pretty terrifying. I know it's a, it's a very powerful, a very significant thing. And for me, seeing how that um, affected people like, I always thought if I ever had the opportunity to even speak for a little bit, not that I'd have to be a pastor or whatever, but if I could teach or preach, which I started to in high school, like I wanted to be able to convey my excitement to other people. Um, and so I think that's why I got into ministry and, and, and that's why I'm still doing it is that these, these are things that excite me. And I think there's things that people should know and I love teaching and stuff like that. So that's kind of why that's the role that I sort of play. I guess. That's so interesting because you guys both like named very different reasons to come to the same sort of place. Yeah. But, so, but at the same time, really cool. yeah. but at the same time, we both recognize that there are things that can be done better, <laughs> whether it's community or representing, you know, God or representing the community. Like those are things that need to be done in a much mm -hmm. better way. And obviously you probably feel some of that because you've moved away from a lot of it. Right. I mean, that's, yeah. I, um, I've moved away partially, I guess, out of just practical reasons, but mm. also because it's church is still a painful place for me. And I, mm. I don't say that to like blame anybody in my life in particular, but just because I think that, I don't know why I'm still figuring that out, I guess. Um, recently I learned something interesting that, um, you know, you see people who ministers who wear a collar under their, you know, mm. their shirt, like a minister collar. And I always thought that was like kind of so silly and antiquated, you know, like, like, do you realize how silly you look? But, um, I recently heard it was, be, it was to, is actually to remind the minister that they are responsible for their words when they speak. Um, and I thought that was really cool. And I think the tradition I came out of, a lot of people were not very responsible for their words yeah. or dumbed things down so much that it almost became insulting for me as a, a think a thinking person, I felt like to be a Christian, at least the way that I was raised, I felt like I had to turn my mind off or, mm -hmm. um, or think like a child and almost become infantilized in that, like in a kind of a way that made me feel sort of paralyzed to even think for myself in any capacity. And so I, I think I, I still like have a lot of pain toward that, that it hurts, yeah. you know, I, I, I was, I never felt quite like I fit because I wanted to talk about, I wanted to use big words and I wanted to talk about big theoretical ideas and I was shut down a lot. So I don't know. Um, I just don't really see that much of a need for church. I think to me, church is my relationships and it's the way I walk around in the world and it's the way that I treat people. And it's like a much bigger vision than like going to a building. And I think you guys agree to that to a certain extent, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's, Absolutely. it's, it's the way that we interact and live in the world. Um, so yeah, yeah I don't and, know. and I, I, I firmly, I totally agree with you, but obviously I'd argue for the necessary, like embodiment of that in an actual group of people and not just like a, a general sort of like, yeah. So th that's why I stick with the church because yeah. I want to be a part of a community that realizes that in some really big way. But and I, I also I would say I fall somewhere in between that where I agree with both of you. And I think that the church should always be an option for people that are more bent that way. And then the church should not be an option for people that are bent in that particular way. You know what I mean? Like, I think, yeah. I think we really, I think we've moved into this place. I think we can move into this place now because of technology and all kinds of different reasons where everything can be more individualized where before it was very like this majority rules type. This is why we structure it this way because the majority of the people are this way. And yeah, there's some isolated people, but we don't take them into the count. And I think we can do that now. And I think it's okay. I was just talking to a pastor friend today who was telling me that he, he's an Episcopalian priest and he said he has 60 people in his church. The average age is 75. 
<laughs> and his church is like big, a big church for most Episcopalian churches in the area. Even though his church on a regular basis is only like 60 people, he has 700 to 1,000 people listening to his sermons anonymously online. And he's like, I don't know what to do with that. Like there's so many people that are interacting with my ideas that I have no idea who they are. I Like as a pastor, that's a nightmare to have all these people in your reach, but you can't take care of them. You can't care about their needs. And so he was like, what do I do? what do I do with that? He's like, I can't, how do I get them in the doors? I'm like, they don't want to come in the doors. <laughs> they don't yeah. want to do it. <laughs> yeah. Why would you ask them to do something that they don't want to do? I mean, they might want to be taken care of and ministered to, but they don't want to go to church. And so I think you're right, Jeff. Like, I think the future of church is finding other ways to meet people. Like, for example, my friend who's starting a pub church is just like getting together for beers and talking about God. And that mm -hmm. really works much better for some people, it's much more interactive and engaging and healing than sitting in a big building with strangers. So I yes, don't know. Absolutely. So yeah. kind of going back a little bit when we talked about this, when we discovered the term for this astronaut thing, the, the, the overview effect, uh, for you, what was that overview effect? Can you remember an instance or, or several instances or a transition in your life where you feel like those were the moments where you began to kind of shift and moving away from what you had in the beginning? I'm thinking you go first, Alan. <laughs> okay. Um, so I, I hinted at this before, but for me, it was, it really was how I looked at the Bible. Um, Cause I, I know that this sounds very simplistic, but our entire community in the church that I grew up in is supposed to be built on the Bible. Like if the Bible says that the community does it, if it doesn't, that the community doesn't. And if it forbids it, the community doesn't do it. It's like this very structured relationship. And I think, Part of that uh, for evangelicalism and for my background is that the Bible is never wrong. You know, the, it's an errant um, and whatever it speaks to, it's an authority on. So like very basic stuff. It, the, the Bible rules out evolution because there's stories in Genesis where God creates the world in seven days. So God created the world in seven days and evolution is wrong. Um, I went to my, my undergrad and learned that, um, the Bible is, you know, sufficient for all things, for faith and for life and godliness. That's a verse from the New Testament. And so therefore, psychology, even though it's helpful sometimes, actually is hurtful because it's saying that, you know, we look to someone other than God or something other than the Bible to be sufficient, whether that's like our own self-esteem or something. So psychology largely got thrown out. Um, and like all those things were happening. And whenever I encountered science or psychology or um, just all this other stuff, I'd see its value and, and it would come into conflict with that. And not just that, when I, when I study the Bible, you start, I started to realize that, um, even the people in the Bible itself don't treat the Bible the way we're supposed to in the, the community that I grew up in. If you read anybody who writes in the new Testament and you like, especially Paul and you read the way they use the Bible and they use the, the, the old Testament, um, it's things that we're not allowed to do. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? Like they think about scripture in a different way than Christians right now do. Um, and so once I realized that um, biblical literalism and inerrancy is actually a very recent development in Christianity, I got this opportunity to see that Christianity was a lot bigger than what I thought. Like I thought Christianity stopped after the Bible was written and started up after like the reformation and, you know, once people started recovering biblical Christianity, Christianity started back up again. It was this moment realizing that my strain of Christianity was actually very new. And it's kind of proud to think that we've got it all right and everyone else has it all wrong. So being able to see the bigger picture of the Christian community and also seeing the Bible not supporting the things that I'm supposed to believe, that for me was the, the, the big effect of saying, well, there must be something else. You know, there, there must be a bigger community out there than I thought. Yeah, the I, I, I guess I had a different experience, but a similar, like kind of eye opening experience. My first year going away to college, I went to a evangelical liberal arts college and coming into school, I was like afraid that all of these other Christian kids weren't really Christians. Like I was very convinced that I was, I had been taught the only true version of Christianity and it was the only way to relate to Jesus through the Holy spirit, through speaking in tongues and through altar calls and all of these things. And so, um, and I had, I had also been taught through that kind of same way that like, 
the church really died out after the book of Acts and then was resurrected at the Zeus Street Revival in the early 1900s. Like, I didn't know there was anything else. I learned about Martin Luther in school, but I, I didn't know that there was just gobs of all of this interesting, fascinating stuff that had happened in between those two points. And the reason we have like words and ideas like the Trinity and, and the reason we think about Jesus as being fully man and fully God and all of these things, like this has all been, these are tools that have been built over time. These ideas have been put together by many, many, many hands and have been shaped by politics and culture and all kinds of events. And so it was like completely eye opening and it, and it, astoundingly exciting for me to interact with theology for the first time when I started taking my first theology classes in college. At the same time, I started engaging some of those ideas and, and doing that kind of work and doing that kind of reading. I was actually a youth intern at a local Assemblies of God church um, where the youth pastor um, really? was pretty avant-garde. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I did that uh, almost okay. two years, almost two years in college. And the youth pastor was kind of like very like, cutting edge and edgy like he wanted to make it cool so like we we spent a lot of time converting the multi-purpose room into like this cool lounge so we like painted the ceiling black and as all it good was youth fun. pastors do right as all good youth, yeah you know you gotta make <laughs> jesus cool and he started attracting a huge crowd of kids and so i remember um one time we got all this construction foam and i started carving it with a hot iron and we made teeth like these giant styrofoam teeth and we actually constructed like a shark's mouth in the youth room it took days and days but it looked so cool when we were done we like sprayed it down with fake blood you know and um it looked really authentic and i asked the youth pastor what he was going to do with it he goes oh i'm gonna um you know, I'm going to do a series on stress. I was like, Oh, cool. You know, this is going to be, this is going to be a lot of fun. And so I get to the youth room that, that Wednesday when he's, um, and I led worship, you know, and everything. And I get to the youth room and he starts his sermon series on stress. And to do so, he starts showing the kids pictures of severed limbs from actual shark attacks, like real uncensored pictures of like gory, bloody stump legs. And there's like six year old, six, uh, sixth grade girls in the room. And I had this epiphany moment, like, oh my God, like this guy doesn't answer to anybody for what he's doing. For sure. He, he, he's traumatizing these children and I helped him do it. And I, what am I doing? Like, what, what are, what are we doing? What is, what is this thing that we're doing? And we call it youth group. And we like, I don't know. I think that's the first time I really started seeing the link between certain types of religious teaching and actual trauma. Like it just, it just made me so angry, but I didn't even have language to know why it made me angry. I couldn't even express it, but I just felt something was really deeply wrong. So I resigned and just threw myself into my studies because it was safer. <laughs> wow. But I think, yeah, we all have the, we all have that wake up moment of like, what am I doing? Yeah. Wh why am I doing this? And what is it actually accomplishing? And am I doing more harm than good? <laughs> Wow. <laughs> that's, that's amazing. Jeff, uh, your epiphany moment, if you have one, should be just as good as that. <laughs> oh, it should be. I could, I could tell some bad youth pastor stories, but I don't know if it gave me any like uh, reflection on life. Um, I, I think for me, I mean, probably similar to, um, to Alan's story in the sense that the, uh, the Bible was always very, very interesting to me. And, uh, even in my denomination that I was a part of would was very um, persistent about trying to get its high schoolers to go to their denominational college. And I didn't want to. And I, I always tried to go whatever my next place was going to be. I was hoping that it would be outside of the bubble of the place that I was currently in. So I decided not to go to my denomination's college. And it was the best decision I ever made because it um, I got exposed to new ideas and different ideas. And uh, it, it was a combination between... Um, uh, one of my professors and uh, a book that I was given by a friend of mine um, by N.T. Wright, Jesus and the Victory of God, this big volume of of study on, on Jesus and the Gospels. And those really were huge shifts for me to look at the Bible in a different way and then realize it was kind of a domino effect. Then that affected by this whole idea of I spent so much time using the Bible as a, uh, I don't know, as a a weapon. <laughs> yeah, not not a weapon, but like a, tool, a an instruction manual. Yeah, like an uh, instruction manual. Like I was convinced that there was an an answer for everything in the Bible, and I realized that um, in combination to what I was learning new about the Bible, and all through college I was a youth pastor as well. So 
interacting with students and, and seeing real life and realizing, man, the way that I look at the Bible now does not translate to the lives of these students. There's got to be another way to look at that because regardless of how I've looked at the Bible, I've always held to that, that thing is that this, this is relevant. And before I looked at it as what this book says literally is relevant. And now it's more the ideas and the heart and the circumstances in this book are relevant still um, to people's lives and can give them hope and all those, you know, mushy things that, that help people move in their lives. And I just, I had to, I had to shift because it wasn't, wasn't making a difference. Uh, and I didn't want to just make a difference with, you know, a cool bloody shark or some nasty pictures or something like that. <laughs> I, you know, I wanted to, I wanted to make a difference that it wasn't that the student wouldn't leave and just be, oh, you know, I feel better, but that they would have something to hold on to that can move them forward like me, like it moved me forward. And uh, something of substance, something that wasn't just fleeting, that was a service or a TV show or a song that was just there and then gone. So, so what does it mean when you say moved you forward? I'm curious. Um, just, just that whole sense of kind of what, what Alan was talking about was that the way that we look at the Bible isn't the only way. And that there's something, there's something here, regardless of what we believe, there's something here that this philosophy, that this, this belief in this God has lasted this long um, and it's changed and it can change and it's moving forward. And something that something, I think it was important for me and, and for me to communicate to other students that you're a part of something bigger, that it's not just you, you're not alone. And not in the sense that, you know, you can talk to one of your youth leaders, but that you, you, you can be a part of something that is, that is huge, that spanned history, that is, um, that is right now affecting millions of people in different ways. And it, it's not this narrow thing. It's, it's a wide open thing. And I, I think it's important to say that, like, so these are some of the reasons that we've felt like we've, we needed to leave, in some sense, the communities that we came from. Um, but there's a lot of other reasons, right? Like I, I read all the time and I hear personal stories of people that have also left and maybe you, the person listening, have also left some sort of evangelical or conservative Christian um, background. But but there's a bunch of reasons, right? I mean, um, and, and, or and there's thinking a, about leaving uh, or thinking about living. And there's a yeah. lot of places to go. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of different ways to end up like we're not all in the same place. And, and certainly other people don't end up in this like weird post evangelical place, right? Like not everyone becomes post evangelical. Some people, you know, move on to other religions or atheism or, um, I don't know, or like just have like a reformed evangelicalism. And I think that, um, it's good to at least know where we came from to kind of trace where we're headed. Right. Yeah. And I think that that's yeah. going to be the, the, the crux of this, this podcast is we'll talk about these things. We'll go more in depth on what we talk about when we talk about the Bible and, and how we look at it now as opposed to how we used to look at it and all kinds of different things that used to be not values, but used to be things that we held dear that have changed and why they changed. And and mm -hmm. that's, you know, we got infinite amount of weeks in front of us to, uh, as long be, as everyone listens. And uh, because we were, we've been evangelical in the past, we believe you should change too. <laughs> and we are going to convince you that you need to go through the process. Oh God, as well. <laughs> no, no, it's something I love about this. When we were talking about this podcast is like, we really wanted to validate that there's so many other places to go from evangelicalism. Like, and we're not put it, placing judgment. Like if people are atheists, yeah. great. Like we're, there's no reason why anyone needs to decide what is the best way. We're just, we can only speak for ourselves and our own journey and what worked for us and even invite people to come on the show as guests who have other stories. You know, if going into Buddhism or going into, uh, you know, all kinds of different paths and it's all good. You know, I think yeah. it, it's really important for us all to learn how to be in community as far as dialoguing with each other and supporting each other and really listening for those stories of honesty yeah. Um, and but, we aren't trying to either on the other side of that, we're not trying to take anyone away from evangelicalism. It's working mm -hmm. for some people for a reason. And we're just saying it didn't for us. And uh, maybe why, as we talk and sometimes we, we maybe come off bitter or upset or whatever, it's just because um, we are <laughs> well, <laughs> maybe we're hurt or I don't know how, if, if down the line, as we go through this whole thing, we, we, we come off as um, upset. It's not that at all. It's just, it's not for us. And part of that is that because it's not for us, it, in some circumstances, it's never been like, oh, no, we totally understand. This isn't for you. And we still have this great relationship. It's been like, oh, but if you're not this, then 
you're this, you know, you're going to hell. Like it's always this extreme either or. And, uh, yeah. I, I, I wouldn't say if you're, if you're listening and you're, you're evangelical and you're listening to us and you're like, Oh my gosh, these people are going to hell and everything about them is wrong or whatever. Stop listening then. You know I mean? That's, that's not the point of this. The point yeah. is that like, we just want people to understand our journey and, and still maintain those relationships and realize you're at this place and we're at this place and that's fine. And yeah. And I part of try it. try to convince you. <laughs> like that's my, <laughs> I'm serious. I say I do believe that there are more faithful ways to like read and interact and more healthy ways to look at stuff. And I think you guys can say this too. If you never change, um, if, and, and you know, Mona and Jeff, if you end up somewhere very different than I will, I will still love you. We will still be connected obviously because you're my cousin and you're my brother-in-law. Um, but also at the same time, I'm always going to be speaking my mind and then learning from you and also trying to convince you that my way is right. <laughs> that's just who I am. And I think that's how I learn, right? Is that we're, we're constantly like representing what we think and hopefully people can, can like either help us change or even learn from what, what we're, what we're learning. Yeah. I think there's definitely that narrative of personal progress and like learning from other people. But I think for me, it goes a little bit deeper or in a different direction, I guess you could say, um, because I myself and many people I know who have left these worlds of conservative Christianity or evangelical Christianity um, have witnessed or like can can <laughs> testify, give a witness, but seriously have gone through the, this incredible painfulness of trying to leave these communities and feeling almost traumatized as a result of trying to leave these communities. Yeah. Because when you're so ingrained that there's only one way to look at the world, this like... I, I've talked to so many people who have felt this overwhelming guilt and grief and shame of trying to forge different paths, even though those paths feel much more true to themselves and much more true to the God that they've experienced yeah. and, and, and the rejection from the community. Um, but just a lot of disorientation and confusion. And so if we can provide some friendship to people who are going through that right now, and mm -hmm. so you don't have to feel as alone, then that's, that's what we're here for as well. For sure. Yeah. Basically, we are all things to all people. So <laughs> join us. That's a that's a Christianism in case you're not, you know, <laughs> well versed. There's this podcast I listen to where like in the beginning, there's this really like cultish voice that says, join the community. <laughs> so I feel like that's appropriate for now. So we will start a cult and make some money. Yeah. Send us your money, people. <laughs> And then we'll send you our love. That's us, though. We'll bless a hanky. We'll yep. send it your way. Yeah, absolutely. First one's always free. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I think that'll do it for us this week. Thank you again for listening. Uh, to support the podcast, please rate, review, or subscribe through iTunes or wherever else you may get your audio content. And uh, we want to hear from you directly. Email us at podcast at irenicast.com or follow us on Twitter at irenicast or on Facebook, facebook.com slash irenicast. Uh, I think that'll do it for this week. I'm Jeff. I'm Mona. And I'm Alan. Oh, and real quick, also, don't forget to check the show notes um, for a link to the blog uh, overview effect. And uh, we will have a supplemental episode this week um, from Mona kind of giving us a, a, a historical background as far as evangelicalism. Um, well, I'll, Mona, go ahead and kind of talk about what that supplemental podcast will be about. Sure. Yeah. If you like history, if that interests you, if you like kind of seeing the connections between different events and times and places and people, which I like to geek out on that kind of stuff. But I have been working on a whole hour of church history focused on the question, what is evangelicalism and where did it come from? And so I actually kind of go back to the beginning of like the early church and the Roman empire, like all the way kind of up to the present day, which is very ambitious to do in an hour. But I had a lot of fun putting it together and I would love for you to listen to it and give me your feedback. Yeah, so we will post that on the Friday after this episode posts, and it'll give you the chance for the weekend to kind of soak in that information and prepare yourself for the Tuesday after that for our second episode of the Iron Cast. So with that being said, thank you for joining the conversation. 